Hello, this is Pastor Don Long, and here we are once again for the Jewish Roots broadcast on FATV as we consider the events around the early history of Christianity leading into our connection with Israel today. There have been times in the past when on this broadcast we split the broadcast with half an hour, just uh, 15 minutes discussion on uh, the Jewish Roots and then another 15 minutes separate from that on uh, news from another perspective uh, regarding Israel. I want to take this week and maybe even the next two and, and dedicate that to looking at some of the issues around modern Israel. It seems when you turn on the news, uh, no matter where you are, somebody has something to say about Israel. Uh, this past weekend, quite a number of the members of our congregation and myself uh, went up to Concord, New Hampshire to a church up there, Pastor Pizza's uh, Word of Life Christian Fellowship. And there we got to hear from two Israeli soldiers, young man and a young woman, uh, about their experiences here in the United States as well as in Israel proper, a little bit of stories of what they do, what their careers are. But they're here in the United States because they're on a speaking tour where they go to a variety of colleges around the United States and share uh, Israel's side of the story. You know, I grew up in a world, and perhaps you did, where uh, there's two sides to a story, but each, each side gets to present uh, what it views it as. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that one man sounds right until the other man gets to present his side of the story. But in the modern campuses of America these days, it seems that there is an element of the, the radical left that doesn't want to hear the side of Israel's story. Uh, there's so much uh, uh, people being aroused over divesting from Israel, uh, getting our stocks out of Israel, that Israel is an apartheid state. And where is the truth in all that? And these uh, young IDF men, a man and woman, uh, shared how they have been startled uh, and amazed at the accusations that have come uh, against them and against Israel. And some of it, they said, doesn't even make any sense. As the young lady said, you know, they, they call the terrorists freedom fighters. And she said, how can you blow up women and children and you're called a freedom fighter? And the fact is that there's a tremendous amount of ignorance uh, on the part of the educational establishment about the history of Israel, about how things came to be where they are or even the fairness of the world. We're moved by the media and what the media has to say. And the media has formed uh, a lot of the opinion, especially on college campuses today. It's amazing in the midst of this that the statistics still show that the vast majority of Americans are overwhelmingly in support of Israel. I think the uh, there's a sizable portion of that that are are biblically based Christians who look in their Bible and understand very clearly that Israel was appointed with a prophetic destiny by Almighty God, that the uh, God of Yeshua, uh, the God of the Christian, is the God of the Jew. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our ancestors. And certainly, you've heard me, you've heard my wife and I, you've heard uh, Jordan and uh, Sherry teach on that on broadcasts in the past, so that's nothing new. I think there's another sizable portion of Americans who simply look at the Middle East and very easily discern, well, who is the democracy? And despite what the, the word might be said about apartheid or whatever, they're able to parse through it and say, wait a minute, uh, everybody in Israel has full voting rights. People in the Arab countries do not have full voting rights. And so it's a, it's a pretty clear indication of where they want to sign. I think for many women, as they begin to wrap their head around the status and role of women uh, in the Arab nations, uh, nations where women are not allowed to drive alone, where women uh, need an escort to be out in public, uh, even more uh, strict fundamentalist Arab nations where women have to dress in garments that, that shield them from, from the public, they cannot have their hair. Uh, exposed, etc. I think women who are aware of that, again, have no problem supporting Israel where women have full freedom. So it, it's somewhat amazing to me that of all places on the campuses of America there would be this 
this movement, which is very verbal, very vocal, very hostile uh, against Israel, uh, it's infected even the academic uh, teachers on the campus as well. But today I want to I want to look at the question of the refugees. And I want to ask the question how the uh, 300, the 30,000 remaining Palestinian refugees remaining from 1948, how somehow or other they've morphed into 5 million uh, refugees today. You know, the Times of Israel reported a couple of weeks ago that during his meeting with Barack Obama, that Mahmoud Abbas not only refused to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, but he reiterated his refusal to abandon the so-called right of return for Palestinian refugees. And to them, when they say Palestinian refugees, they're talking about a number they peg at five million, and they believe they have a right to go and move into Israel, and, and Israel needs to absorb them. So I want to I want to get a little background on the United Nations and its refugee uh, efforts. The head of refugee work in the United Nations is called the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Let me uh, let me put that up in front of you, so you can kind of take it down if you've got notes going. UNHRC, the United Nations High Commission for refugees, otherwise for short known as the UN Refugee Commission. Now the United Nations is concerned about the nations of the world, is rightly concerned about refugees around the world, and starting after World War II, the United Nations made it a part of their work to come in and assist with refugees. I teach a current events class with our homeschool children here uh, at the church, and we were just talking a while back about refugees and what, what are refugees. And they can be refugees due to natural disaster. There's an earthquake, there's a tsunami, there's a drought, and people leave an area and become refugees because of natural disaster. Uh, there can be persecution, where an ethnic element is being murdered and killed and uh, people become refugees because otherwise they're going to die. There can be the expulsion of groups. Uh, over 800,000 Jews, for example, were expelled from Arab countries uh, after the War of 1948. And so countries that once had 200,000 Jews now have none. There can be refugees simply because of economic pressure or social pressure. A Bethlehem, which was once 20% uh, Christian, is now down to 2% Christian. Uh, what is going on there? Christians are feeling unsafe, and so they leave. And of course, there can be refugees because of war. So you have the war in Syria, and you have Assad and his government, and then you have the opposition forces and in between are villages and cities that are being entirely decimated and people by the tens of thousands, over 150,000, leave the area and they go to the border of the nearest country. Sometimes they're allowed to enter into that country for a certain amount, but they always get there. And the question is, who's going to take care of them? And so the United Nations uh, High Commission for Refugees, or the Refugee Commission, provides things like food and water and clothing and tents so they can live. But the, the goal of the Refugee Commission is twofold. If they're able to uh, settle the war and it comes to a peaceful conclusion, uh, one goal would be to resettle the refugees back into their uh, native homes. Uh, or the same if there's a natural disaster. Once the disaster's over, the Refugee Commission has taken care of the people, and now the goal is to return them to their country. The other uh, goal is, if the war continues or settlement cannot be reached, to resettle the populations uh, in new countries. And thus, after World War II, we had this massive resettlement of, of people, refugees from World War II, uh, into the nations of the world. 
And usually these commissions for a ethnic group last for two or three years, hopefully, sometime they might last eight or 10 years, but their goal is to put themselves out of business. In other words, we gather together the workers, we help, we do all the aid work, we do to, what we can do to resettle, we get people to be received into other nations, and the goal is that we come to a point, maybe three, maybe five, maybe eight or 10 years, where it's over. The last refugee has been settled, and now we can go and deal with a, another crisis. In other words, they're no longer refugees. How strange it would be to think of a, um, a Jewish person and family who had moved to New York from Germany. Uh, they were in the camp at Auschwitz. They got put into a United Nations refugee camp, and then they were admitted to the United States. And that family has now lived in the United States they become citizens of the United States, and their children, therefore, are citizens of the United States. We would never think of them as refugees. And if they said, well, you know, we're, a, we're refugees from Germany, it's like, what do you mean you're refugees? You're US citizens. Now, underneath the UNHRC, there's another organization called the UNRWA. That's the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Works Agency. Now this agency in the UN is unique. It's the only relief agency ever appointed to deal with just one people group. It was appointed to deal with the Palestinians. It is the only one that 60 years after it started, has not done anything to solve the issue. 60 years, remember what I said, the goal is in three to five years, eight to 10 at most, we have refugees either resettled or uh, into other nations, and they're no longer refugees. But the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, in other words, the relief agency that deals with so-called Palestinian refugees has been in existence for over 60 years and has not done anything about the problem. Now, part of it uh, is to understand what the definition is of a refugee according to UNRWA. So let me put this definition up in front of you. That a Palestinian refugee was designed, uh, defined as persons whose normal place of re residence was Palestine during the period of 1 June 1946 to 15 May 1948 and who lost both home and means of livelihood as a result of the conflict. Now, first of all, that's a definition that says if you lived only two years in Palestine, you were considered uh, a Palestinian uh, refugee. In other words, that was your homeland. In no other nation have they such a small term that says you only had to live there two years, and now that's considered your home, and now you qualify as a refugee. Uh, but putting that aside, if we look at the count of refugees at the end of the War of Independence in 1948, there were roughly 711,000 uh, refugees from that war, Palestinian refugees. Uh, the current estimate would be that if we look at the ages of the people, we can make an estimate and say that of the 711,000, we would expect that there may be 30,000 of them still left. So if nobody was resettled, and nobody got, got into new nations, then we would say, well, then the refugees really should be around 30,000. However, the UNRWA redefined what a refugee is. And they said that a refugee, to qualify as a refugee, it's not only you, but it's your children, your grandchildren, and even your great-grandchildren qualify as refugees. 
That's never been applied anywhere in the world. You're the refugee, we're gonna resettle you, but your children are not the refugees and certainly not your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. So what the Palestinian Refugee Agency did is ensure that there will be Palestinian refugees forever and the number will keep growing, something that is totally absurd when you talk about refugees. So the UNRA claims, let me put this up here, that there are five million refugees. Now look at that. 711 around that number, 711,000 after the war, which should have reduced to 30,000. Instead, they're claiming there are five million Palestinian refugees. Uh, excuse me, who's doing the counting? And who changed the rules of how you count? It's like some of our government agencies that like to tell us that the economy's improving and they pull numbers out of a hat to prove it, but we all know the numbers don't sound right. Of that five million, by the way, two million of them are already citizens of another nation. So in other words, I can be a citizen of the country, the nation of Jordan. I have citizenship in Jordan. But my grandfather was a refugee, and therefore I qualify as a grandchild as a refugee. My goodness, it is a welfare system gone berserk. How many people can we get on the public dole? Oh, let's get it. Well, wait a minute. They live in Jordan. They have a job. They're Jordanian citizens. Oh, no, no. They're still refugees. Only applies to the Palestinians no other nation in Africa, no other nation in the Middle East, no other nation in the eastern part of the world. No nation gets to qualify people as refugees beyond one generation, let alone four generations. Absolutely amazing. Now, what that means is that 99% of those that the Palestinian Authority calls refugees are not, in fact, refugees. You know, if the politicians of the world had the courage to deal with that and say, wait a minute, if the members of the United Nations said, wait a minute, we're not going to count them as refugees, by the way, seeing as the Arab bloc sways the voting in the General Assembly, it's unlikely that's ever going to happen. But if at least the members of the Security Council would stand up and say, we are not going to allow you, allow you to count as refugees what all the other agencies in the United Nation are not allowed to count as refugees. If we stood up and did that, we would probably find there's 30,000 refugees, and I think we could find a solution to where those 30,000 refugees should be in a short amount of time. Now, uh, it, it, it's interesting because if we, if we look at the, the, the payroll, in other words, how many people are uh, paid to conduct the affairs of the agencies? The United Nations High Commission on Refugees, that's the one that deals with the world. Everything, they deal with all the world but the Palestinians. That commission deals right now with 43 million refugees. Now get that number in your mind. 43 million refugees dealt by the United Nations High Commission on Refugees Worldwide. And in order to do that, they have a payroll of 7,685. So with 7,685 employees of that relief commission, they service 43 million refugees around the world. Now let's look at the Palestinian refugee group, the UNRWA. They have a, uh, a payroll of 29,000. Now even if we accepted their inflated number, which is false, absurd, and a lie, but if we accepted it at 5 million, they're taking 29,000 paid employees to service 5 million, whereas the relief agency dealing with the whole world only takes 
a little more than 7,000 to deal with 43 million. <laughs> what I told our class of students was this. If that was a business, it would go bankrupt. If I can run my business servicing 43 million customers with 7,000 employees, and you have the same business and you go into it and you're only trying to service 5,000 customers, but you gotta hire 29,000 to do it, you're gonna go broke and I'm gonna get your business. I mean, that's absurd that you have one eighth of the po population, but you've got uh, almost uh, four times, over four times actually, the number of employees. Very bad business model. <laughs> What on earth is going on here? On the other hand, if we took the 30,000 legitimate refugees, in other words, the number who would, under all other definitions, qualify as Palestinian refugees, if we took that number of, of, of 30,000, then we'd see how absurd it is. Then we'd have 29,000 people being paid to service 30,000 customers. That's absurd. Now. You know, our forefathers said years ago, and when I teach classes on democracy, I always come back to this, that when Americans realize they can vote money to themselves, and those who vote the money for themselves outnumber the others, then the government is on its way to economic collapse. Why? Because people will never say, oh, I volunteer, don't pay me. When things get tight, you know, somebody else has to take a cut, I'll raise the taxes, but I need to get paid, and in fact, I should get paid higher. <laughs> Thus it is, by the way, that a U.S. congressman this last week, you know, uh, complained that the congressmen don't get paid enough, they get 174000 a year. Uh, I find that quite amazing. His answer was, they're, they're like the board of directors of the largest economy, economic institution in the world. My immediate response was, well, then you failed as a board of directors and you should be fired. Their approval rating is at the lowest it's ever been in history, and yet he believes we should have more money. See, when you have that kind of socialism, who's going to give it up? If you give people free money, how are you ever going to take away those benefits? If I give you free cell phones, how am I going to take it back? If I give you uh, food stamps, how am I ever going to get you off of that? If I give you uh, welfare, how do I get you off of welfare? because you got money coming, and if I give you welfare for each additional child you have, then there's no motivation to keep your family to, to two or three. Maybe the more children we have, the more we get in. That's what's going on in the PA. Money is pouring into the Palestinian Authority by the, tri the, the billions of dollars to support this population of refugees that really aren't, and who's gonna stand up and say to that agency, You've got one year and then 29,000 of you got to go find other jobs. It is absurd when it comes to the refugee question. And so when we hear, well, they have a right to return. Now, what will happen is that people will go and they'll, the reporters will go into a refugee camp and take pictures of it. Now, I, I'm not saying refugee camps are fun places to be. They are not. But the question is, who is responsible for the refugee camps? You see, at the end of the War of Independence in 1948, nearly 800,000 Jews were literally kicked out of their Arab countries. Iraq, Lebanon, Iran, Saudi Arabia, all ex Jordan, expelled Jews. You're Jewish, get out of here. We don't want you around. By the way, when you go, leave tomorrow. Don't take anything with you. We're going to confiscate everything in your house. We're going to confiscate your house. If you didn't get your money out of the bank, we'll confiscate your bank account. Literally, you're a refugee left with nothing. Where are those 800,000 Jewish refugees? Where did they go? The vast majority of them went to Israel. Well, how come there are not big refugee camps in Israel where these refugees and their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are living in poverty? Because Israel absorbed them into the country, taught them how to earn a living, gave them subsistence till they could get on their feet, built housing for them, made them part of the country. Because Israel said, you're Jewish, 
you are our brothers. You might be an Iranian Jew, an Iraqi Jew, a Lebanese Jew, an African Jew, but come in, you're Jewish, you're part of us. Where were the Arab nations saying to the Palestinians, you're our Arab brothers, come in and live with us? Jordan did not want to receive them. So at the end of the war, when Jordan controlled the West Bank, Jordan was very content to keep all the Palestinians in the West Bank. They did not want them in Jordan. Iraq did not want them in Iraq. Syria didn't want them in Syria. Lebanon didn't want them. Everybody kept them in refugee camps. These are your brothers. So if anyone's responsible for the sad state of the Palestinian refugees, it is the Arab nations of the world, the Arab nations of the Middle East, not Israel. Israel is not the cause of the Palestinian refugee problem. It is the Arabs that are the direct cause of the Palestinian refugee problem. And when we in the world who can at least come out of the darkness into the light and can say, you know, that makes sense. Why are we perpetuating this thing? Well, there's only one reason the Arabs want to do it. It allows them to keep pressure on Israel. Why do they want a right to return? Why do they want five million Arabs to be able to return to Israel? Because that would swing the entire population of, of Israel. Israel's open to Arabs. Israel has Arab citizens. There are Arab members of the Knesset. So Israel's not against Arabs, but it's never been heard of in history that this amount of people are forced back into a nation. The Arabs do not want to see the Palestinians free. Now, ultimately, that has a lot to do with the two-state solution. Because if, in fact, there is a state called Palestine, then we're going to expect that Palestine take care of the Palestinian refugees, and they really don't want to own up to that. So their push is not for a separate state. Their push is to destroy the state of Israel. This is really a different view of the news. It's a view of what's been going on, a view that you don't see in the mainline media, but it is the truth. It is another perspective of what's going on in the Middle East. This is Pastor Don Long. It's been good to be with you today. Tune in next week as we share more of what's going on in the Middle East.